Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you uh, for coming uh, this morning. I would imagine uh, the name tags have something to do with the uh, community potluck uh, that's going to be occurring uh, after our uh, meditation and talk uh, this morning. Some of you uh, may know uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday morning actually, at the same time, well actually 11 o'clock, uh, we had a memorial service uh, for one of our members, uh, both a member of our community, uh, but even more a long-term member of the Thich Nhat Hanh community who had actually moved to Florida about seven, eight years ago, ago from uh, the D.C. area. Uh, Bill Menza, who is also a member of the Order of Interbeing and a Dharma teacher in uh, Thich Nhat Hanh Plum Village tradition. Uh, he died recently of cancer. And so we had a memorial service yesterday. Many members attended. His family was there, uh, friends who weren't members. It was quite a uh, meaningful uh, time. A good, a good send-off uh, for Bill. And as several people commented, uh, if he was here, he would have loved it. Uh, uh, but uh, because of the service yesterday and uh, the topic, I thought it might be uh, interesting and helpful to talk uh, this morning a little bit about uh, death. Uh, and we all know that death is uh, one of those things that is omnipresent uh, in life, uh, but it is one of those things uh, that is never talked about until it occurs. In a certain way, we might say uh, death uh, is the elephant in the living room. Uh, is there anybody in this room who does not know a relative a friend uh, who has not died. I mean, have you, have you known, never known somebody who's been a friend or family member and you've never known death? It is important to note that, that that is probably, uh, death is really in a certain way the most significant thing happening in this life, isn't it? Uh, because there is this phenomena that we all know that people leave. Right? People are constantly leaving. Uh, as I said yesterday in the service, it is very interesting to me that, uh, that those people who, uh, who might have gathered around at our birth and celebrated our birth are not there at our death. Right? At Bill's memorial service uh, yesterday, uh, everybody who had been around at his birth, pretty much all of them were gone, had died. And basically, uh, who was there was sort of uh, relationships Bill picked up along the way, so to speak. And again, that is uh, significant. Uh, and it is something to, uh, to reflect deeply on. Uh, it is something uh, that we do not like to uh, reflect deeply on. Uh, it is a fact that uh, many of us are uncomfortable uh, contemplating the death, death of our, death of everyone abstractly, the death of ourselves in a more personal way, death, death of people we love. I mean, there are people who say, oh, I can, uh, yeah, my own death, but I, but the death of people I love, I, I find that hard. Or we, we have all kinds of uh, ideas around it and uh, uh, resistances to it. Uh, but death has to be looked at. Because, as I said, it is the most significant thing for each of us. It is our mortality. It is the fact that this does not go on forever. 
actually it goes on in the, in the scheme of things quite shortly, for quite a short period of time. Uh, so again, I want to spend a few moments uh, talking about that uh, this morning uh, with you, uh, because I think it is something that we need to talk about. Uh, because, again, because we see uh, in the popular press, uh, in our talk with people, our conversations, even with dear ones, close ones, uh, the fact that we are all going to die, and that everyone uh, we know, everyone we love, everyone we care about, everyone we work with is going to die. Our children are going to die. Our grandchildren are going to die. Uh, has great significance, it has great meaning, uh, more than just being a fact. And it is so important uh, for, for really good reasons uh, that we uh, notice the elephant in the living room, that we come out of denial, uh, and that we also come out of fear. Uh, we know we live in an age of what's called, of many people, anxiety. Uh, and many people, uh, you know, uh, I think back in the 60s or 50s, <laughs> there were books about the age of anxiety. Uh, now we would probably call our age the age of stress. Uh, but for most people, stress is really anxiety. Anxiety is always about something that we are thinking, worrying, concerned that is going to happen in the future. We are worried about the future. And we are often worried about our ability to handle what we imagine may happen in the future. But if there's one fear that I think is very common that people don't talk about and may be related to all our myriad little fears is our fear of death is our fear of no longer being here, of our fear of losing, not having all the things that we have and identify with. And often that unspoken fear about how am I going to deal with this, can I deal with this, and being scared of what may happen in this deeper way I think also spills out into all our myriad little fears about the future and how am I going to handle this. And I think that if we come to peace with how we handle the biggest loss, the biggest change that could happen to any human beings, uh, we will find that all these myriad little things that so worry us and, and, and make us afraid uh, may pale in significant and we may find out uh, that living a life without fear, living a life without anxiety, living a life of fearlessness uh, is open to all of us. Uh, again, for those of you who have been coming a while, you've heard me say there would not be Buddhism if it wasn't for death. Because it was the coming in contact with death and sickness and old age uh, that uh, so upset a newly married, a newly fathered, I mean, new, new to fatherhood uh, young man uh, 2,600 years ago in India who became, uh, you know, after years of practice, uh, known as the Buddha, but then he was just known as Siddhartha. It was his encounter with seeing a dead person. It was encounter with seeing sickness, with his encounters with seeing aging, and that his encounter was not superfluous, it was not superficial. It like all of a sudden, everything he had based his happiness on, which was the permanence of the way things are, the stability of the way things are, and that this was going to continue. 
when he realized, you know, quite, you know, in a, quite directly, you know, because, uh, you know, he, you know, in the in the stories, it says uh, his parents, because for various reasons, has always had always kept him from that side of life. Uh, but it could also mean. Uh, that just because of the nature of his life, he had just never really seen it, or if he had seen it, he'd never really stopped and seen it, which is like many of us. You know, one of the things about our culture also, I mean, our own particular culture, is uh, as opposed to more traditional cultures, or perhaps the culture is not that far away of our uh, grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-parents, and, and, and also many people still in the world, is sickness, old age, and death happened in our homes, right? It happened in our neighborhood. People did not go, people didn't go off for birth. People gave birth at home. People got sick at home. People died with their families at home, right? I mean, the idea that you go off somewhere, uh, to, you know, to, to, to you know, be sick, <laughs> and you go off somewhere to die is fairly recent, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's not even that. I mean, uh, we, can, we can live in our world now and not only see death, but we could not see sickness. So, I mean, when I actually visited Bill in, in the hospital uh, just uh, less than a week before he died down in Sarasota, uh, having not been in a hospital uh, for many years, and it was quite a large hospital. <laughs> it, was, it took up blocks and blocks. And I couldn't help but notice as I walked around and went up the floors, that this is a hospital filled with what? Very sick people. Right? Oh, here they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, here they are. You know, you don't see them around on the streets. Here they are. <coughs> you know, the same way if we went to assisted, nerv uh, assisted nursing facilities and nursing homes, we would see what? Oh, here they are. You know, here are people all, you know, you go into these nursing homes all in wheelchairs, all in, oh, here they are. We don't see them out on the streets, do we? We don't see them in the malls, we don't see them, but here they are. And because we don't see them, and we don't see them when they die, I remember uh, many, many years ago, when I was first beginning my professional career, and I did an internship at a, at a, at a, a community nursing home. It was like a public n uh, nursing, it was, but it really, it, <laughs> uh, decades ago, it had been, been, been the poorhouse, the county poorhouse. And then uh, as times changed, it became the county uh, uh, nursing home. And when I was there, uh, one of the things that really threw me in the beginning was how they handled death. So here you have this nursing home with maybe 100, 200 people, uh, and they're all in wheelchairs. And there was really only one thing happening there, right? They were there to die. I mean, that was the only thing that awaited them. I mean, we could talk about nursing homes and what goes on there, but, the, but I mean, the, the only significant event that was waiting for them at that point was death. If there was one thing that was never talked about in that nursing home, was what? Death. And you know what happened when somebody died? I mean, this was really shocking to me. When somebody would die, the nursing staff would go down the hall and close every door on that hall. So when they removed the person who had died, nobody would see them. Nobody would see them, there was no acknowledgement, there was no service. I thought, wow, not only how bizarre, but how horrible. Right? Because all those people, when the doors were closed, did they think, that's going to happen to me? One day I'm going to die. My body's going to be taken away. No one's going to see. 
and the next day no one's going to be noticed, and, and the next day there'll be somebody new in my bed. So that's a little extreme, isn't it? Uh, but I think it's symptomatic. And again, the fact that even at a place like a nursing home where the only thing waiting for these poor people is death, nobody talks about it. Okay. So, what is there to say about death? <laughs> what, what is there to be talked about? Why is it so significant in Buddhism? to acknowledge at the core this impermanent nature of life. And the impermanent nature of life is, is at its most intense and powerful with the fact that we will die, everyone we know will die, our parents will die, our grandparents will die, our children will die, our grandchildren, you know, our colleagues, everybody's going to die. Why is that really such a powerful and awakening acknowledgement. And why is developing a fearlessness, which means, you know, it's not like I'm fearless, you know, like war zone. It means I am not afraid. I am not afraid of dying. When we think, when we believe that this will go on forever, that you will be here forever, that I will be here forever, you know, it's, we're easily fooled, aren't we? Because why? When we look around, what's, what's obvious to us? We are all here. Right? So. Uh, talking about death, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, why, why talk about that, right? Because we're all here, aren't we? We're all alive, we're all here, we look very solid and stable and permanent. Uh, when we uh, leave, uh, we might say to somebody, uh, see you next week, right? We do talk this way, we do act this way. But to acknowledge the fragility of life, to acknowledge the impermanence of life, of all life, and to acknowledge that death, which means the end of our physical life and the end of our connection. I mean, whatever your, I mean, right now in my office, I have boxes of Bill Menz's books that his family wanted to donate uh, to our library. They brought them yesterday. When I opened those books, and Bill was a voracious reader of Dharma books, <laughs> he was also a, a, a voracious uh, underliner, <laughs> highlighter. Notes in margins, little piece of paper stuck in with <laughs> reminders. I mean, it was like, these are Bill's books, and these were all his thoughts and ideas about what he was reading. But Bill is no longer connected to these books. He's gone. And all his thoughts and ideas that he written down, all, gone. Right? And now these books, which were obviously, uh, each one of them was wrapped, you know, he had a cover that he had made himself, <laughs> and that he had written some in. Uh, you know, the question for us is, you know, what do we do with it? Right? This, this that was like probably the, you know, so meaningful, you know, you know how we are with our books? Now it's like, I'm thinking, you know, well, what do I do with all these books that are all marked up? You know? We can't put them in our library. I mean, you know, it's, would anybody want them? You know, even a used bookstore wouldn't take them, would they? 
that's happened just in a, in, in a week or two. That that which was valuable now has no value. Because that life that was connected to it is gone. Each of us have that, don't we? We have our relationships. We have our things. We have our hopes, our fears, our dreams, our plans. Right? Which we so define our life by. And yet, like that, our relationship to all these things will be severed. Right? I mean, you've heard me say before, even our bodies. People tell us, we love you, right? Right? Don't they tell us that? We love you. We cherish you. We care about you. What can we do for you, right? Isn't the way we talk to people and they talk to us, right? Watch it. Because as soon as you're dead, they're going to be thinking about, how can I dispose of this body? How quick can I get him out of here? Isn't that the truth? That which we cherished and loved. When we die, it's like, you know, do we bury it? Do we burn it? You know what I mean? What, you, know, you know, what do we do with it? But one thing, we can't let it stay around here, can we? Isn't that the truth? Yeah. Even with our loved ones, we have to admit, because there is an acknowledgement there is something going on here that has nothing to do with the way we would like it to be and want it to be and hope it would be, and, but that there's a reality that is present that we need to uh, wake up to. And again, as it is said in the teachings, uh, death comes to everyone. What is unknown is what? Where, where and when? Generally, um, we say, you know, statistically, it comes more often uh, to the old than the young, but we know that's not true either. Do Isn't that true? We all know people uh, young. And we may know people when we were young, contemporaries, who died for all kinds of reasons. So even though there is this sense that it only happens to the, the old, we know that's not true. Life is very fragile. It can be taken away in a moment to all of us. We do not know how we're going to die. Whatever, you know, if you ask people how would they like to die, people will tell you what. The people would say what? I'd like to go quickly. People say, I'd like to go quickly. Uh, people would say what? I'd like to go uh, without pain, right? Uh, uh, people say, yeah, I don't want a long, drawn out. Or, you know, I mean, people have all kinds of uh, uh, ideas about how they want to die. And yet the truth is what? We have no idea how we're going to die, do we? Isn't that the truth? Yeah, that's the truth. We know we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know how we're going to die. <coughs> that's the truth. And the same is about everybody else in our life. Isn't that the truth? So, one can take that whole body of information that I've just been sharing with you uh, for the last 20, 30 minutes, and go what? Whew, what a bummer. <laughs> Right? Or one can get uh, depressed, one can get morbid, one can get sad, or one could get scared and anxious and worried. Right? There are many, many uh, uh, possibilities here. I think it's because of all of that uh, one can get angry. Damn it! Shouldn't be this way, should it? Right? You know, I mean, if you've ever been around people who die, or, in, or not die, but are in the dying process, you know all of that is true. Some people get very sad, and some people get very scared, and some people get very angry. And it's the same with those people around, uh, you know, the caretakers, the loved ones. They also have that, you know, 
they're angry that it's happening. Or there's, you know, there's, anyhow, you, you, you understand. But there is a more a healthier, we might say, and a transforming uh, response that really can uh, establish one in a life of meaning and purpose and also uh, give meaning and purpose uh, to life and to give a fearlessness in life if this is directly faced. And actually in Buddhism, the contemplations, the reflection on death, either in sort of the way I am talking about reflecting uh, on, uh, you know, that death comes to everyone and the time, the knowing there, there, uh, there are these nine reflections uh, in the Thich Nhat Hanh tradition. There are the five remembrances, which we uh, chant here. Uh, you know, there are many ways, uh, even uh, in the meditative traditions, there are these very traditional meditations where one uh, imagines death. One lays on the ground and one really imagines their own body dying. They imagine it, you know, the dissolution of the body, the decay of the body. One kind of over and over again goes through this. It's very traditional, uh, you know, for in a, in a more monks or whatever, to go to uh, graveyards, right? Cremation grounds. Uh, so they can see it. I re actually, I think he, I remember when I was in my early 20s and just beginning uh, my Buddhist practice, uh, I was working, I'd gotten like a job <laughs> working in a hospital. I, I think they don't have them anymore, right? They're called orderlies. I don't know if they have orderlies anymore. <laughs> I forget. I, I, I mean, how, how I got a job as an orderly, I don't know. Uh, probably tells something about the hospital. But anyhow, I was, uh, I was at orderly doing these things in the hospital, and there was a, uh, a nurse there, a male nurse. And uh, it, it seemed to be his job to take the bodies uh, of people who died down to the morgue. And I had never really, I mean, I'd been around, you know, funerals, you know, as a young family, but I'd never really been in contact with a dead body. And uh, so I asked him, would he always come get me uh, uh, when someone had died? And I would uh, help him, you know, they wheeled him down. And, and the morgue, and I remember uh, just uh, wanting to uh, experience that, uh, to look at a dead body and to touch a dead body and to feel its coldness as its life. So I would really uh, understand it. Uh, directly. Uh, so that uh, ability to both uh, think about death in the way that I'm talking about and to really imagine it or to come very directly to it uh, helps us break out of denial. Denial. Helps us really touch it in a very deep and profound way. So we see Something has happened here, right? The person has left, right? For those of you who've been around people who've died, that's, to me, the most uh, amazing thing. We can see they've left. The body is still there. You know, that which I identified as that person was obviously not that person because the body is still here, right? But that which animated it, that has left. And we can talk about some other point, what, what that is about, what death is really about. But, but that, that fact is so, is so incredible to, to actually see. And again, if you grow up in a culture where people are dying all the time around you at home and in your neighbors, it is not something extraordinary. Uh, but you can see in our culture, it's almost like we have to go out of our way. We have to go out of our way uh, to really see what death looks like. Right? Because oftentimes, even when we go to funerals and they have open caskets, uh, the person looks pretty good. 
you know, you often go, wow, he doesn't look this good in years. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> so, you know, there's something almost kind of unbelievable about that because they, they look so healthy uh, and, so, and so serene. You know, it's, it's almost, uh, anyhow, it is what it is. So, having gone through this process of deeply connecting with our own mortality, the mortality of everybody, the fragility of life, the impermanence of life, and having deepened that through actually uh, coming to people who've died or, or imagining in our own life this way, so it becomes real to us. How is this good? <laughs> Why is this good for us? Again, spiritual life, a walking a, a, a spiritual path in life. Now, there are many reasons to do that, aren't there? I mean, good reasons. Uh, one reason is it makes us happier. Uh, for another reason, it, uh, it allows us to be uh, better people and bring the greater happiness and compassion to others. But the energy behind that, that's driving that, for the Buddha began with the contemplation of this impermanent nature of life. That it doesn't go on forever. Which means that everything that is here now is fragile and impermanent and may not be here tomorrow or I might not be here tomorrow, right? Now, that fact, and I'm calling it a fact because it is a fact, right? Because we, you know, again, death comes to everyone, time and place unknown. Does anybody here think they're going to die in the coming week? <laughs> Statistically, is there a chance that one of us may die in the coming week? Yes. Yes. Even the little ones, right? We don't know. Right? Car accidents, other kinds of things. We, we, do, we don't know. Now, does that make us scared? Does that terrify us? Does that want to kind of hide away? Right? That's one response, isn't it? close our eyes, control, manipulate. Uh, but even that can't help, can it? So the other thing is to open to it. To open to it in a deep, open acceptance and understanding of that this is simply the way things are. That there is birth, and when there is birth, within the family there is what? And friends, there is what? Joy. There's happiness. And then there is life, and then there is death. And at death, it's the opposite of birth. Here, we appeared, right? And here, we disappear, right? Appearance, disappearance. Coming and going. Right. And that is just the cycle of life that everyone and everything, not just human beings, everything, plants and animals and worlds, this is just the nature of life. It's not just a jaundice view of life. It's not just a morbid view of life. This is just life. Right? Now, because of that, the truth is, if one is, is, is reflecting on this deeply and not stopping there, the next important thing is, oh, if that is the case, if there is ultimately no ground of permanence and stability in life just because that is its nature, then that means that what? 
that every moment, every encounter, right now is what? Is the only thing that I can know and rely on, right? Because I do not know what's going to happen next. But I do know in this moment I am here. So therefore, when you hear about things like, anybody ever hear about a teaching about or a sentence about learn to live in the present moment? Maybe that's why some people are here. They've read that somewhere and it sounded good to them. Right? Or even more prosaic, uh, stop and smell the roses. Right? We all heard that even growing up, right? Somebody would say that. You need to stop and smell. The, there are probably even songs about stopping and smelling the roses. But living in the present moment and stopping and smelling the roses as opposed to being a kind of little bit of a life enhancer or a little bit of, a, of a good advice becomes much more significant and deeper because it says the truth is this is the only moment that I know. Right? And whatever I'm doing right now is the only thing that I know that my life is about. Right? Because I don't know how things are going to unfold. Now, I'm just talking about death, right? I didn't talk about change. I didn't talk about sickness. I didn't talk about aging. I didn't talk about gain, loss, and up and down. You know what I'm saying? All the things which we know about life, right? Sometimes we feel like this. Sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes they like us. Sometimes they don't like us. Sometimes things go our way. Sometimes things don't go our way, right? All that stuff. Sometimes there's pain. Sometimes there's pleasure. All that which is endlessly changing. But rather than being endlessly concerned about all the change, endlessly being worried about how things might change, endlessly being angry or resentful about how things are changing, endlessly being sad about things that changed in the past, rather than doing all that, I would know if I have really done this in this very meaningful way is, why am I wasting all my time and my life filled with worry, filled with resentment, filled with fear, filled with despair, filled with, right? Why am I endlessly concerned about what she's doing or he's doing or they didn't do and this didn't do, and, right? Because the truth is all I know is that right now, this is the most important moment I have. Whatever happened in the past is gone. Whatever is going to happen in the future is unknown. But if I learn how to deal in, in if I learn how to be, how to relate with presence and awareness and openness and intelligence to this moment, whatever this moment is, because I don't have a life anywhere else but this moment, I have a template for life. I have a template for life. If I can learn to live fearlessly, which means openly, the fearless person is open, right? The person filled with fear is closed. Oh, I don't want that to happen. I can't deal with this. I can't handle that. What if it, you know? It's like, you know, we're looking, the fearful person is always looking through life with these, uh, like through slits. The person is open, is open. Whatever happens will happen, and I'll just be present and deal with it. Right? There's no fear in that. Death, if you can resolve your fears, your worries around death, which is the big one, Everything else is easy, right? And that's just not, uh, you know, Buddhism speaking. Uh, all of us, or maybe I shouldn't say all of us, but some of us, either personally or maybe know somebody or read something, 
we know that people uh, who have near-death experiences, you know, there's actually a whole body of literature of people who have uh, NDEs, these near-death experiences, or many people who go through uh, a real bout of, uh, of, of significant uh, illness or disease which uh, has the potential to be fatal, and then they, you know, come out of that. Often come out of it with a what? Being different people, right? Different way of relating to life. Don't sweat the small stuff, right? We don't want to be one of those people that in our deathbed see what a, what a petty life I led, right? God, if I think back of all the things that I was consumed with and all the things that worried me and all my resentments and all, you know, for what? Right? We don't want to be one of those people, do we? When we come to our death, we want to come to our death without any regrets, with knowing that we've led a meaningful life, that we haven't wasted time, and we, or we haven't, you know, uh, spent our life in just meaningless pursuits or kind of uh, negative, afflictive kinds of mind states uh, all amount uh, up to nothing. What will help us? Meditation on death and impermanence. Every day, to remind ourselves, this, is, this could be my last day. To remind ourselves, this could be the last time I see this person. To remind myself, this may be the last time I eat this. How do I want this to be? That's what the meditation, the contemplation, the coming out of denial, the coming out of repression, and being present to this reality of death is so beneficial. Comments and questions? Yes. Could you speak up a little bit? I, I spent a lot of time in the last couple of years contemplating um, death. Um, because it, it, it used to terrify me. Mm -hmm. Really terrify me. No. But did you ever hear, I mean, it used to terrify him. Contemplating the fact that we will not be here. <laughs> <laughs> and that all our activities and pursuits, at the end of the day, we will not be around to enjoy at some point, is, is uh, you know, is a game changer, as we say. Yes. And, uh, there was an author, I read the second name, who was a his, his conjecture was that, that uh, we're driven by that fear, especially after a certain age, like everything is kind of driven underlined by that fear, at least in our culture, of uh, death, you know, and it's affected all the way out. Um, and, and I kind of find, found that out to be a little trick to myself as well. I thought, what, what do I do? You know, it, 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 it frightened me. And it, 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 so, like something you said, um, I just read an author. Since death is certain, but the time of death is uncertain, how then shall I live my life? And it mm -hmm. really had an effect on me. And then I volunteered for hospice, you know, for the same reasons. I had a conference, I learned that that wasn't sanitized and things like that. And this was, this was you know, nursing home and things like that. And, and, and that was all from you know, a cemetery conversation. All these things that, that I've done to where my fear is abated. Every once in a while, something comes up and I'm like, oh, you know. Yeah. But uh, it's, a, it's a lot less. And I'm reminded that it's been attributed to the Buddha or the teachings, and that nothing is to be clung to with the iron mind. 
Yeah. That's what? That's eyes and mind. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's what we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, non-attachment is a big part of it. It's, yeah. It's so key for me because even, even on a daily basis, in my life, I, I can practice with little debts, you know, relationships that have yeah, yeah. to a person and a job, all these things right. that I can look at. And if I hold on to them as I or mine, if I identify with them, then I suffer more. Mm-hmm. So let me, because this is being, I don't know if I can summarize all that, but uh, what is your name again? Peter. Peter is just sharing uh, his own experience of, uh, of used to being very fearful with, of death and his own uh, mortality and not being here. Uh, we, uh, you know, didn't run from it, but uh, read, investigated, thought about, contemplated, went to work in a nursing home and hospice so he could be around it more and over time has uh, developed a greater comfort uh, with it and also referred to, uh, you know, the kind of teachings where uh, which again we're not getting into today, but about how uh, it is our attachment uh, to life and our things and our bodies and claiming it for I and me and mine uh, that kind of you know get us into this uh, uh, greater difficulty in, in, in just being present uh, to the dying process. Uh, because again, uh, one of the big things, and again, it's just another whole area, I uh, didn't get into, but uh, you know, one of the biggest things that scares the hell out of us, beside uh, our body dying, is the me, the I that we identify as me, not being around. You know, I mean, if we've always identified ourselves as an I, then no longer having that, we may wonder, who am I then, really? Which, of course, is a, at its deepest level, is really what Buddhism and meditation is about: is really discovering. Uh, who and what I am. So if I'm not this body, if I'm not this I, me, mine, if I'm not this uh, uh, self, then what am I? Now, of course, in Buddhism, uh, the Buddha says we are, uh, we are Buddhas. We are birthless. We, our nature is birthless and deathless. And that actually Buddhist meditation, as one takes it deeper and deeper, is about actual the realization of that, which really helps with uh, being fearless and not being attached. Uh, but it's a process. So good. Thank you. Heather, yes. Can you say a few words about legacy? Since Jimmy Carter, uh, I saw his interview, and you know, directly, Bill Collins, and I think he's saying about Bill Wilkins, oh, I'll be like, what is legacy? I mean, I really have been thinking about that. Because Jimmy Carter, and really, even uh, Obama, who was 54 years old, people are saying, well, you open up two with a kind of What is it? Is it a I think it's, you know. Yeah. I mean, again, <laughs> to think about how one wants to do good in this life and leave that as a legacy, meaning for future generations, I mean, that's good. But, you know, how many people remember? I mean, we do go. I think a lot of that, again, I think there's a good side to it, you know, to wanting to do good and, and thinking about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, life is a meaningful thing and I'm going to leave it and, you know, how, what, what good can I do in this world? I think that's good. Uh, but I think a lot of it is people are searching for permanence. People are searching for permanence. You know, we are going to be forgotten, right? We're going to be forgotten. Does anybody know the names of their great-great-grandparents? I mean, you know. Right? I mean, that's, that's it. And that's hard for us to take. But that is the truth. And it doesn't have to be a source of, of uh, sadness or remorse. It's just understanding, yeah. Because new people will come. New life comes. Right? There's new life back there, right? One day, uh, she may be up here. Well, you know, most of us will maybe be gone by then, right? And not just, you know, there's, there's something else that goes on in life, which is this endless movement of birth and death, right? And I, and I think because of people are fearful of that, that they want to put their names on things. They want to put their names on buildings, you know? Because they, they, they want to feel permanent, you know? 
people will remember me, people will know me. And again, I think it's, it's this unwillingness to acknowledge, you know, the leaves fall from the trees and nourish the earth. Flowers bloom, flowers wilt, flowers die, flowers disappear. I mean, that is the natural of order of things. I think human beings, the more they are out of the natural rhythm of things, as, as we know we are, you know, big time, out of the natural rhythm of things, out of the natural uh, uh, connection with the earth and the rhythms of the earth, as we live more and more in artificial environments where our stimulation is, is artificial, we don't, we, we have lost that natural connection, I think, that we had, you know, <laughs> I don't know, for millenniums, you know, uh, because there is a natural rhythm to life, to seasons, to birth and death. Again, when you saw it all around you, when you saw it in the animal world, when you saw it in the natural world, uh, I think it was these kinds of truths that we have to work harder to <laughs> uh, get. I think we're much, uh, you know, you know, much more accessible. I mean, the only, but of course, you go well. Twenty six hundred years ago, uh, even the Buddha at that time seemed to go kind of get it at a deeper level uh, than everybody else was getting it. So yes, any, any other, um, yes. What is your name? Victoria. Victoria, yes. So this is kind of about my talk about like that. It's really mm-hmm. kind of you know, <laughs> so again, you you you. I mean, yours is a little unique, okay. So, but I'm asking to repeat it. But basically, Victoria is 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 saying that her own personal experience. Uh, there was a time uh, several years ago uh, when she was in a very dark place, and uh, death, calm, peaceful, uh, seemed quite attractive, right? And so, therefore, uh, in her journey uh, out of uh, kind of those that that place of, of being suicidal, uh, she was told, you know, basically, don't ever go there. And then she comes here, and, <laughs> and we are talking about death. Again, I don't think, and we, you know, that's a whole topic, and we only have a couple of minutes. But again, Victoria, I don't think. Suicide is about death. I think suicide is about life. I think about suicide is about somebody getting themselves in a place in life that seems that that feels so miserable, right? Not only that, but possibilities of getting out of it do not seem to exist, right? Therefore, death as an option or a solution to that life problem seems like a good solution. Is that clear? So I think suicide is really about life and about somebody getting to that place where they think there are no options left to them. You know, what I would say to you is that's wrong. Okay? There are ways, many ways, to lead a meaningful, happy life. And I'm glad you walked yourself out of that corner. Right? You know, when you walk in, you know, this is a big room, Victoria, right? But if you walk into the corner and you just face the corner, you would think, oh no, this is a tiny little dark room, right? Just got to turn around and you see what? 
But suicide is like when you're in the corner and you think that's what life's all about. So I'm glad you're here. Okay, I'm glad you're here. But uh, again, uh, you know, having, having worked with people over the years who are suicidal, uh, You know, it is interesting, isn't it? Uh, because in a certain way, uh, well, sometimes, I'm not all the time, I mean, I'm not making a blanket statement because it's not true, but sometimes uh, people's depression about life is actually maybe somewhat true. You know, that their life has been meaningless, right? And uh, and that that may be again one of those things that we never want to talk about. Right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, in our life, we keep ourselves so busy, active, consuming, searching the internet, endlessly consuming, and endlessly being stimulated, and endlessly running and chasing after that we never stop and go, this is really a meaningful life. <laughs> you know, this is really giving me happiness, right? And that's why I think many people kind of, at some point, fall into depressions in our, in our culture. Because underneath a lot of our activity and our scurrying about, uh, there is this kind of sense, see, maybe it's all kind of meaningless. It's not really giving me happiness, you know? And when we, all of a sudden, when that place breaks through or we fall into that place, uh, you know, we don't know what to do. And oftentimes what happens is we're just medicated these days. But I think there could be another way for some. You know, where there, there may be some, something valid that uh, life up to now has not been meaningful or that the suffering has been too much. Right, but again, uh, that coming back to Buddhism, the Buddha began with suffering. That was his first noble truth. His second noble truth was it's a cause of suffering. His third noble truth was it's an end of suffering, and his fourth noble truth was how to you know the path, how to do it. So in Buddhism, uh, we like death. We don't shy away from suffering. We say, yeah, yeah, there is suffering. But let us look deeply into it to see what's causing it. And if we can understand what's causing it, we can understand how to eliminate or change those causes. So we then have the possibility of living a life free of suffering, which is what Buddhism is about. A Buddha is someone who is what? Who is awake and who lives a life of meaning and happiness and all that good stuff. So that could be in your future too. Thank you. Uh, so it's 10 of 12. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you.